Welcome all to this second seminar on uh, the EDR project. Um, my name is Mats Carlson. I will present on uh, uh, the work package 7. Um, I will uh, talk some about, the, uh, some about the general aspects that we've been dealing with um, and then towards the end of this seminar focus on uh, uh, the sampling importance of the sampling procedure for estimating parameter uncertainty. I uh, will uh, uh, happily take any questions afterwards. Uh, I might be able to actually take you uh, during the, the presentation, but uh, I might not be able to focus on uh, both the presentation and the chat line at the same time. So uh, th this is the work package. The structure of the EDR project. Okay, the voice breaks up. I can see. So I can try to. Is this a better sound? Okay. It seems to be um, better for the moment. So simulation of clinical trials and um, the models uh, we're using uh, in simulation and also for other purposes here um, are um, known in the mixed effects models. So this um, project concerns uh, trials in small population groups. And it's been obvious that it's difficult to run trials with, with many subjects. So the question is, uh, how can we uh, maximally inform our decisions based on few individuals? And one of the mixed effects models that incorporates both drug and disease characteristics offer uh, an attractive alternative here. And they're attractive because they integrate information across uh, the data uh, from different subjects uh, uh, at different times of observation. So we're dealing with longitudinal analysis. Uh, when we have uh, multiple variables that speaks to the uh, decision in question, uh, we can utilize those. Uh, for example, if we have anticoagulant markers together with bleeding events, we might use both uh, types of information. And we can account for heterogeneity ac across subjects um, um, based on uh, known differences, uh, such as covariates and predictors. Also, linear mixed effects models allow us to incorporate prior knowledge, prior knowledge about uh, the drug action and the disease. Um, we can also use uh, that knowledge in constraining the parameter space for uh, the parameters of the model. There might be other knowledge or assumptions that uh, are appropriate to impose on the model, making uh, uh, better use of the data we have at hand. So the type, the, the type of information that uh, these models can provide to trial and treatment decisions uh, are uh, to inform based on uh, hypothesis tests, so model contrasts. Uh, they might be based on uh, uncertainty distribution of the parameters of the model, or maybe some uh, uh, predictive distribution based on the model and the parameter uncertainty distribution. And I'll illustrate each one of these in the coming uh, slides. So uh, this is an illustration of two proof of concept uh, trials. These are simulated uh, 
results, but the models are derived from uh, real clinical trial data. So in each panel, we have two uh, curves. One is based on a t-test, uh, um, comparing end of treatment uh, observations in two treatment arms. And the other curve, uh, the one to the left, is based on the really mixed effects model, uh, which incorporates um, longitudinal data from each uh, patient. And as you can see, uh, there is quite uh, a difference in the number of uh, patients needed for a particular power, uh, so that uh, the nonlinear mixed effects model uh, has uh, lower sample sizes for the same uh, expected power. And this, of course, uh, has to do with using uh, more data and making additional assumptions uh, regarding uh, uh, regarding the model. And we can see that there is a difference here to the left. Uh, we have a factor four in difference for the sample size at 80% power. Uh, to the right, we have a factor eight. And the, 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 the difference between just looking at end of treatment data and longitudinal data, of course, has to do with uh, aspects like how, how many observations are made longitudinally, uh, what is the information content in an individual observations? How many variables are being uh, uh, observed? Um, and, and a number of other factors. So that was based on hypothesis tests. Uh, we can also use non effect, mixed effects models uh, in other ways. And here is a, a paper um, based on uh, well, uh, written by uh, FDA colleagues. Um, these were uh, persons who were employed by the FDA at the, at the time. And they make a suggestion for how to um, design pediatric studies, so certainly a, a small population group. And as you can see, let's see if I can use the mouse, down here in this section, the suggestion is to power the study based on the parameter uncertainty of uh, two uh, primary parameters, the clearance of the drug and the volume of distribution of the drug, such that uh, there is sufficient information in the trial to uh, generate uh, good dosing uh, recommendations uh, for uh, patients at different ages. Sometimes it's not the parameter distributions themselves, but some uh, derived uh, metric um, that is of interest, as illustrated here. Uh, it could be the uh, probability of success, uh, according to, to some metric that is a, um, the basis for decision. So um, these type of, of probability-based, model-derived metrics are routinely used in many companies. Uh, this example comes uh, mainly from Pfizer in, in this publication, but there is a, has been an industry-wide initiative in Europe to um, promote uh, more informed drug discovery and development, resulting in uh, this paper uh, coming out earlier this year. And in uh, in this uh, initiative, there has also been uh, considerable interactions uh, with the regulatory authorities. One example of uh, um, regulatory uh, interaction around uh, decisions um, of political trials was this um, presentation presented by Novartis colleagues uh, mainly. Uh, around equivalence testing for biosimilars, where the, um, their intent was to use longitudinal model-based tests instead of the classical equivalence test uh, on account of the high power uh, of the model-based test. And you can see the red, uh, the red um, symbols having uh, tighter confidence intervals, uh, which for an equivalence test is, you know, means uh, higher power. 
So uh, models can be used in different ways to inform trial and treatment decisions, but there uh, are certainly uh, many aspects that need to be addressed before they are more routinely used in, in uh, this type of situation. And I'll be touching during the rest of, of the seminar on some of the aspects that we have been involved in during the EBR um, and the EBR project. So, uh, for the type of uh, power calculation that I showed, the right hand curve, the one for a T test, that whole uh, curve could be derived and generated uh, in, a, in a fraction of a second. Uh, for the left hand curve, uh, which is based on the nonlinear mixed effects models, where each uh, point on that curve represents the model fit to uh, hundreds of rather complex models. And so every data point will probably um, take about a day or so to generate at the time when this uh, profile was made, uh, if it had been done in the standard way. And of course, one isn't interested in only one point, and one isn't interested in only uh, one curve because you want to compare different types of designs, length uh, of files, different observations, etc. So, in order to be able to do timely uh, power calculations for nonlinear mixed effects models, we considered uh, two uh, uh, methods uh, that we developed uh, for that purpose. The first one, uh, we call Monte Carlo mapped power. Uh, Ha, is based on the simulation of only one data set at a very large data set. So, it, um, as a rule of thumb, we usually say about 50 times the size of the expected trial uh, would be the, a good size for this data set. Then, uh, we fit both uh, the full and the reduced models, so the models we are interested in contrasting to this data set. And for each individual, we get the difference in the objective function value under those two models. So the, the minus two times the log likelihood. So then we have n times uh, n number of uh, objective function value differences, and we can then uh, resample from that pool. Uh, and we can resample uh, for a particular study size that we're interested in, and we would do that many times over so we can get statistics of the expected difference, overall difference in, in the objective function value, which gives us the, uh, whether a particular power in question will be successful or not. The other uh, um, method, the parametric power estimation, in this we simulate uh, a number of data sets, maybe a hundred uh, or a, a few hundred, uh, with uh, a certain number of subjects. Uh, maybe around the expected study size. For each one of these, we'll fit the full and the reduced model. So we then going to have uh, a few hundred uh, differences in the objective function value for this particular uh, study size. And we can uh, fit the distribution uh, model to the, uh, this, uh, these values. And it's a non-central chi-square distribution, which has only one parameter we need to estimate. And this lambda parameter that we now estimate, we can then uh, use in calculating the expected power at other uh, study sizes because it has the, 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 the neat properties of being proportional to study size. So, uh, one of the uh, aspects we need to be uh, assuring ourselves of is uh, whether we have uh, adequate type 1 error control. And 15 years ago, uh, we looked at this uh, with non-linear non mixed effects models, and that's what you can see in the graph here. Um, we looked at the main interest at this time was comparing different estimation methods, where clearly some of the, the earlier um, more and the cruder approximations uh, also could result in elevated false positive uh, rates, so uh, uh, a lack of control of type 1 error. But what you can see is that 
even for the most appropriate method in this case, the, the performance of the type 1 error is dependent on the study size. So as the number of individuals decrease, we can see that there is an increase in the uh, actual significance level above the 5%, which was the nominal level uh, in this particular case. So if we're interested in small population trials, uh, we uh, should be concerned with the type 1 error control for nominal mixed effects models. So in this particular study, what we used was a permutation test to uh, gain control, and, and during the course of uh, the IDEOL um, project, we uh, facilitated that to, to make it a routine uh, calculation uh, for uh, the models that we are using. So we can use a permutation test now um, for uh, pre-specified nonlinear mixed effects models. We also investigated a situation where we might want to do some model building, um, but do that on blinded data using a mixture model where the allocation uh, is unknown um, during the model building, and it's only after uh, providing the, the reference distribution that the, the, the blinding is uh, uh, the unblinding is done uh, at the final model. Another way uh, of addressing the issue of uh, uh, the situation where a, a model, a, pre a single pre-specified model, might not be an appropriate description of the data is uh, model averaging, and that. Example I mentioned from uh, Novartis in 2012 on the bioequivalence testing uh, utilized model averaging. We've also been exploring uh, model averaging in a few different situations um, in this project, looking at uh, longitudinal dose response, uh, biosimilar superior superiority testing, and confidence interval uh, based uh, QT tests. So, I mentioned in the beginning that um, it is um, desirable to uh, analyze data using only the mixed effects models uh, because we make use of all the information, or at least uh, uh, more information than just in the treatment data. But of course, the, the, the best uh, situation is if we can uh, design the trial uh, to provide maximum information for the intended uh, analysis, and if that is a nonlinear mixed effects model, that's of course what we would like to design for. And with small population, uh, it might the, the need for adaptive or the, the call for adaptive uh, trials is, is even larger, uh, as we want to have um, maximized the information content uh, in each individual. So, um, adaptive model based. A model-based adaptive optimal design is something that um, we have been uh, looking at in in the context of of the ideal project. And here is one uh, example of how it can be implemented. For example, in pediatric trials with intra analysis after each cohort, and then the update of the design if necessary, and then uh, implementation of a stopping stopping procedure. Which brings me to the uh, final part of this presentation, which is the parameter uncertainty aspect. And when it comes to the parameter uncertainty, um, these are providing the decision basis both when the parameter uncertainty distribution is the, the metric of interest, but also uh, any other um, derived aspect based on, uh, for example, confidence intervals. And we have several ways to estimate the, the parameter uncertainty in non mixed effects models. The two most commonly used are the uh, covariance matrix and the non-parametric bootstrap. So we have different methods uh, that might 
provide different uh, parameter uncertainty and they have different properties. So which one to use? Uh, well, that was one question. Uh, we're very concerned typically with um, the adequacy of our parameter estimates and, and assess that in um, many graphical analyses and other analyses, but um, we don't typically assess the adequacy of the parameter uncertainty. And of course, if you're, if you're not using it for anything particular, then it might not um, matter how, um, how good those uh, estimates are, but if you truly are going to um, use the parameter uncertainty in any decision basis, then of course you want to assure that those are, are good estimates. So you, you, just, you don't just want to generate parameter uncertainty, you also want to assess whether they're um, useful. And that was one of the um, option, one of the aspects we wanted to, to do. So just to say a few more words about um, the parameter uncertainty methods. So the covariance matrix, which is a standard output in, in, in the most software, is not always retrievable, um, though. When using it in simulations or other assessments, we typically need to uh, assume symmetry and linear correlations between the, the parameters. And in particular for nonlinear mixed effects models, the confidence intervals and the uncertainty distributions might be asymmetric. And the reason for that is that we have nonlinear models. Um, we have to read. <coughs> excuse me. We have uh, variability parameters that often have a very skewed uncertainty distribution. And we have uh, parameter boundaries that are driven by um, uh, physiological boundaries and, and other. So the other metric is the, the bootstrap. We know that the bootstrap is um, sensitive to a small sample size. Um, for simple models, if we just want to look at the mean or, for example, uh, the height of a group of individuals, we know that uh, the bootstrap is robust to very small sample sizes. But for nonlinear mixed effects models, we don't really know um, how the, what the size dependence is for the performance of uh, the bootstrap. So we could uh, expect that um, much larger or larger sample sizes are needed for the bootstrap to be applicable in uh, or be a good estimate of the imprecision in the mixed effects models. Here we're uh, simultaneously estimating multiple parameters and we have hierarchical models with two or more level of random effects. Um, no two individuals are containing the same amount of information, even if they have the same sampling times and the same covariates, they would actually contain different amount of information just based on their underlying uh, parameter values. We also uh, often do data-driven model development, which means that we build the model to the size that the data set uh, 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 can uh, hold. So we have a relatively large model for at least some aspects of the data. And we have model misspecification. So some of these factors might uh, play a role. So what we wanted to um, achieve here was to both look at a generate a diagnostic for parameter uncertainty uh, as well as investigate the size uh, uh, relationship uh, for a bootstrap. And this is a paper that uh, has just been published. So the principle of this diagnostic, the uh, DOFE distribution, is that we if we have a, a parameter uncertainty distribution, we can sample parameter vectors from it. Um, so we do that, um, and then we apply that um, to the original data set and evaluate the goodness of it as the objective function value. Based on that objective function value, we uh, then subtract the objective function value from the final model uh, of the original data set, which of course has a lower 
uh, value unless it's a local minima. So we now have a, a difference from the, the best parameter vector. And we do that for a large number of uh, parameter vectors. Um, so we get the distribution of uh, the this uh, delta uh, vector function value. We can compare that with the reference distribution. And that reference distribution is a chi-square distribution uh, with the degrees of freedom as many as the number of parameters uh, in the model. Because that's really what you're, what you're uh, comparing here. You, you're fixing, uh, in one case, all parameters. That's the one from, that comes from the parameter uncertainty distribution. And of course, the, the one that you estimated in the original data set is uh, true. So if we look at that type of comparison, this is what we can see. And this is for, uh, done for two pharmacokinetic examples here. The phenobarbital, uh, data, a phenobarbital data set that um, is often used as a, as a comparison. It uh, comes with the minimum uh, distribution as a, as a standard data set. It contains uh, 59 subjects. And when the delta of V distribution uh, is uh, plotted, we can see that in blue here, based on the bootstrap. What we can see is that the distribution lies above the reference distribution, which is, if I remember correctly, uh, uh, Casper distribution with seven degrees of freedom because there are seven estimated parameters here. So we can see that there are some individuals that have the function value uh, differences from the best fit that are much higher than what you would expect. The same thing for another data set, the paproxacin data set here. If we simulate data from the model and uh, perform bootstrap on each one of these, we can see a similar situation. However, if we go to a bigger data set, uh, so we now increase the size of the study eight times, we can see that the bootstrap procedure appears to perform uh, appropriately. And this was based on uh, real data context. We looked at it a little bit um, also using uh, simulation examples. Here it was based on a very simple model with uh, 20, and, and we looked at 20, 50, or 200 patients. The same thing uh, came up here. Uh, lower uh, study sizes result within an in inappropriate, uh, or a disagreement, I should say, with a, a reference chi-square distribution, whereas as the number of individuals in the study group, uh, the agreement uh, became better. So why would the bootstrap distributions perform poorly uh, with uh, these lower numbers? Well, um, one reason is that uh, the Variability parameters are underestimated. Uh, so here we can see the, the coverage of the inter-individual variability parameters for volume and clearance, as well as the residual error. And we can see with small sample sizes, the coverage is uh, too low. And this is um, something that is, is well known for uh, bias in the, the estimates uh, when the sample size becomes too small. And of course, it's not just the sample size as a absolute uh, metric. It's, it's the relationship between the complexity of the model and the information in the data. And in this case, this was a very simple model, just a two-parameter uh, model, or two-PK parameter model. So um, to summarize, then, we have uh, the covariance matrix today. But it, it, has some problems, especially if you want to use the parameter uncertainty or something derived from it uh, as a decision criteria. And we have the bootstrap that has computational problems, maybe when, when the, the, the studies are very large. Um, but for small data sets, uh, it appears 
um, also to be inappropriate. So we, we have a need for additional um, methods for parameter uncertainty estimation. And what we have explored here is the sampling importance, the sampling methodology, trying to uh, apply that to modeling the mixed effects models. Just a moment. So um, this is a three-step procedure, and the idea is to um, approximate an unknown posterior distribution of the parameters by a weighted known distribution. So the first step is uh, to take uh, the known distribution, a proposal uh, parameter uncertainty distribution. And typically, we take this from the covariance matrix. Uh, but we could take it from other uh, sources as well. The second step is an importance weighting. Uh, so we evaluate each parameter vector. And then in the third step, we resample uh, um, the parameter vectors. Uh, we resample a fraction of them. And we do that according to the importance weighting. And then uh, this distribution, because we don't uh, resample all, can take on a different distribution than the uh, original proposal. And the, the crucial step here is the second one, the importance weighting. And the way that is done is that the importance ratio is a ratio uh, between the, the goodness of fit of the parameter vector to the data, so the likelihood of the data given the parameter vector divided with the likelihood of the vector in the proposal. So a parameter vector close to the point estimates have a high, much higher likelihood uh, than one uh, at the tails of the distributions. But at the same time, you would expect it to have a, uh, a better, a higher likelihood than or the data will have a high likelihood given this parameter vector. So um, what we do in the importance ratio is that we compare how well a parameter vector fits the data compared to how well uh, we expect it to fit the data. So if the ratio is 1, the, the uh, parameter vector fits just as well as we would expect. And this parameter vector is not re-weighted in the resampling in the third step. If the importance ratio is one uh, is above one, then this parameter vector uh, describes the data better than expected, and it's upweighted with a high probability then of being resampled. First, if the in, uh, importance ratio is lower than one, it's worse than expected, and it's downweighted and less likely to be resampled. So here we can see uh, the likelihood uh, based on the data and the likelihood based on the covariance matrix. So the um, uh, components related to the uh, numerator and the denominator of, of the importance ratio. And if the distribution had been perfect, then we would have expected these to be clustered around the, the, the blue line, the line of identity. But uh, as you can see, they are not, uh, which means that we can improve on this proposal density. So uh, the sampling importance resampling is a procedure uh, which has many options. Um, for a given uh, proposal, we can uh, vary the number of samples, number of parameter vectors that uh, we want to uh, investigate. And the higher the number, the better. Uh, as this number goes towards infinity, uh, we're essentially guaranteed to get the posterior um, uncertainty correct. But it's also a costly way of increasing precision because uh, while we don't re-estimate any parameters, we need to evaluate the objective function value to each parameter vector of this uh, first step. <clears throat> to get the likelihood of the data given this parameter vector. So um, 
We might uh, look to other ways of improving precision. And in the resampling, uh, we have another way of um, in, um, potentially improving the efficiency, and that is to um, resample uh, the replacement so that a parameter vector that is particularly uh, good in relation to its expectation, uh, it describes the data well in, in relation to its expectation, might be resampled several times. However, this procedure can also um, um, make the posterior uh, worse than the, the proposal. So it, <coughs> it might not be uh, always a good idea, and uh, we have not used it uh, in our final uh, implementations of this. Um, the ideal uh, proposal distribution is the true posterior distribution. So the proposal should be as close to the posterior as possible, but if it uh, is not equal to the posterior, it's better than it's, that it's too wide than too constrained. It's easier to decrease the size of the um, uncertainty distribution than to widen it. So, sorry, I think, yes. So, <clears throat> instead of using a very large number for the initial sample, uh, we found that it's more efficient to uh, iterate around the SIR procedure. So, uh, sample uh, a relatively uh, small um, uh, number of parameter vectors, and, and this sample is uh, denoted capital M. Uh, do importance weighting uh, and resample based on this, then fit a new uh, multivariate distribution, and we use the box Cox distribution to fit this resample set of parameter uh, vectors. Arriving at the new proposal, uh, we sample from that proposal, and then uh, we do uh, the procedure all over again. And we can do that uh, a few times, and we can change the relationship between the number of uh, samples in step one and the number of samples in step three. And because we iterate, uh, we will be getting evaluations of both the uh, several proposals and then also posteriors. So the the very first, the top line here, is the proposal from the covariance matrix. And just like the bootstrap uh, diagnostic I showed earlier for phenobarbital and perfluxacin data sets, uh, this one typically shows um, a curve that is is consistently above the reference line, and we can summarize the discrepancy between these lines as the estimated degrees of freedom. And the degree of freedom for the reference line is the number of parameters that is estimated in the model. And we can estimate then uh, the um, average value of the DOV curve um, for the proposal. And we can just tabulate that. So we can see this first proposal had a value of 25.4. Uh, whereas the reference was 22, so there were 22 models, uh, parameters in this model. And then, as we uh, estimate, uh, as we iterate, we get a lower value for the um, the OV distribution uh, estimate in the SIR, so 19, 17, 17. The proposals which come from the box Cox distribution then that are estimated based on each uh, subsequent proposal is slightly different because it's a box Cox uh, fit to the multivariate distribution. But what we can see here is that this uh, uh, this iterative procedure has actually converged in about three steps, and that's typically what we see um, that the SIR procedure 
uh, when based on a covariance matrix, um, converge in, uh, in three steps. However, it's not always we have a covariance matrix to start our, uh, our um, uh, proposal distribution with. Uh, if that is not uh, successful to, to get the covariance matrix, sometimes we do a limited bootstrap and uh, run out. It's really a limited bootstrap. Um, or we can just start with a, a generic covariance matrix, uh, which uh, we have as uh, typically being 50% uh, relative standard error. It's better to err on the on the right side than the the, the too narrow. We then have implemented a five-step procedure, even if it uh, typically is sufficient with three. If you have a generic or limited bootstrap, it might require some more. Um, after this automatic five-step procedure, we check the diagnostics. If we can see that the last two uh, posteriors uh, have the same um, uh, DOV uh, estimate or the curves are on top of each other, then uh, we can uh, uh, conclude that the parameter uncertainty distribution appears appropriate, and uh, we can use that. Um, if they're different, then we can add iterations, and this might be needed if you start from a, a, a just a guess of the covariance matrix, for example. Uh, if we find that the uh, original proposal actually was far too narrow, then we have some additional diagnostics that um, that um, we can use in uh, knowing which parameters that appear to be inappropriate, having an inappropriate uh, uh, uncertainty distribution in the proposal. So um, again, the SIR procedure is something that um, uh, has recently been published. Uh, it's in the reference list, and uh, another paper be, uh, describing uh, this uh, procedure. Is being uh, uh, is being finalized at the moment. So, with that, I just want to conclude um, around the sampling importance resampling. That this is a method that allows for symmetry and uncertainty distribution. It does not require parameter reestimation. So we have a, a fast and stable method. Um, everything is relative, but uh, compared to the bootstrap, at least, we typically see uh, in terms of run times that it, it's on average 10% um, of the time of the bootstrap. And even though evaluations of um, um, the likelihood uh, are not guaranteed to be successful, they certainly are uh, much more robust than estimations. Uh, it's also uh, applicable to uh, unbalanced and small studies uh, in a different manner than the bootstrap. Um, and also um, in situations, for example, where you have informative priors where you can't really use a bootstrap, uh, we don't see any reason why a uh, SIR wouldn't be a, a, a useful uh, method. So with that, I'll just here are some references of work we've done in relation to what I've just been uh, talking about, uh, some presentations and some uh, papers, and the presentations uh, often come with uh, a slide set or a post that you can download. And uh, here are the, <coughs> the people at uh, Uppsala University that have been involved in this. And uh, again, I thank uh, the uh, colleagues in Aachen for uh, on the uh, coordination of this project and uh, for helping with the webinar. And I thank you for your for listening. And I'm happy to take any uh, questions or listen to any comments, or at least reading any comments.
Okay, so Nicole or Diane, uh, any information that we should convey to those? I actually gave the presentation from a PowerPoint. I don't know if I, it's probably uh, better to download a, a PDF. Um, I have one, but I didn't know how to download it or load it after I've uploaded the, the PowerPoint. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> the uh, it's um, the likelihood is uh, an evaluation step in Norman, so it's max value equals zero uh, essentially. That's how it's been done. Okay, doesn't seem to be any more activity. I don't know if we should close this. 